Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's story is another instalment of the incredible series by the wonderful mind of Vato Cabron. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear? And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story, entitled My wife and I bought a ranch in the mountains last year, and my neighbour had some interesting suggestions on how to manage our new land. Part 4 The Scarecrows Let's get straight into that. The shift from summer to fall happened fast. Seemed like it went from dry, mountain heat on September 1st to full-on postcard autumn in weeks. The aspens exploded with yellow, fiery colour, the evenings got crisp, and the elk started bugling, and the river flows slowed. The crickets were getting quiet, and the pigs were getting blankets of snow. Lucy and Sasha continued to grow close and kindled their friendship. I guess Dan and Lucy had four encounters of their own with the bear chase over the summer. Dan actually told me about how they designed a layout of their homestead in a way that made it so they always had a healthy lead on the bear chase. All four times that summer, Dan popped a naked man with his bolt-action rifle, and the closest it ever got was about 165 yards. And that's only because I was taking a leak when I heard the bastard, Dan claimed. They were very casual about it all. I hoped we could get to that point too. Lucy's stories were often Sasha and I's topics of enthusiastic dinner analysis. Lucy told Sasha about one spring in early 1990s when their daughter saw the light in one of the ponds and instead of telling her parents or brothers as they raised her to, she went to try and play with it. Well, Dan and Lucy felt the light was near before seeing it for the first time, and heard drumming start from the mountains. They found the girl up to her chest in the water, transfixed on the light, which just went out, the second Dan waded in to pull her away. I guess they ran to start a fire anyway, but the drumming only grew louder and closer. They spent three days locked in a house, which had become surrounded. Sasha asked, By what? But Lucy ignored the question and went on saying that the Shoshon family who lived north of Dan and Lucy, the ones who sold them their ranch, and then taught them methods to ward off the spirit, came by to check why Dan had missed a meeting at their ranch and to discuss an irrigation plan, and were able to lift the bad medicine that had befallen the home. Well, Lucy said that when they emerged from the house, they found that every calf and lamb they had that spring had been skinned. The skin sewn together with yucca string and stretched into bloody sails between the trees around their house with cords made of their own sinew. I guess Dan, in an exhausted rage, accused the Shoshon family of being the ones who had done it. But the patriarch of the Shoshon family, Dan called him Old Joe, calmed him and insisted that Dan join him for a ride up the mountain on horseback that afternoon. Last time Dan stopped by and asked him how they'd feel about me stopping by their ranch to introduce myself, he responded, Oh, they'll come to you when they are ready. I pried Dan a bit to learn more, but he just said they're pretty normal folk that keep to themselves. Real family-centric. He said old Joe's sons and daughters run the big old 3,000-acre ranch to the north now, while old Joe teaches the grandkids the old language, how to track, ride, and pray in the old way. Dan said they all still hunt and run their trap lines throughout the area, and that they'd likely stop by soon. Fair enough, I figured. And as he left that day, he said, Remember, cutting them up can release the spirit. You gotta burn the dolls just as you found them. After dinner, on the evening of September 28th, Sash and I made a fire and looked back over Dan and Lucy's notes regarding Scarecrow season. Although I already had, almost on a daily basis, after living through this summer, my last shred of doubt in all this mysterious bullshit was long gone. It was all as real as any other damn thing to me. 
I had to burn a pile set up outside the back gate where I trucked in a few yards of sand. The gate was about twenty yards from the corner of the porch. I picked up a pro-grade rope in lasso, had some gas and matches near the door. I was rigged to flip and set to jet. What follows are some excerpts from the Scarecrow portion of Dan and Lucy's notes. Usually only happens two to three times a season. Overnight, a human-sized burlap and canvas doll would appear somewhere quite close to the front door of your home. You don't need to search for them. You'll see them right away. They seem to want to be found. And they will be in some casual human position, sitting on a bench on your porch steps or standing leaning on your porch railing. They are between 40 or 50 pounds, 5 to 6 feet tall, and dressed up in a pioneer type clothing with a realistic face done in stitchwork key point. And they must be burned for more than 20 yards from your home. If they are lit on fire closer than 20 yards to your home, they will come alive and stay alive. And will try to run into your home. And they will fight you and hurt you to get inside your home and burn it down. And the scarecrows are not very dangerous once you move them away from your home. But moving them is unpleasant and can be very disturbing. Once they are in motion, they wake up sporadically and can talk and move and will try to escape. Key point, they only wake up for around five seconds and then go limp again. They will awake in spasms continually but only while being moved. And they can also talk and scream and cry. Ignore it. Ignore the sympathy. They must be burned by sunset. If they are not and you hear the drumming, leave. Immediately. This description scared Sasha more than any of the other spirit manifestations. And Lucy told Sasha that she refused to deal with these and made Dan do it. And Dan had also mentioned that even he first told me about this shit all those months ago, that the scarecrow was the one he found the most unpleasant. I just didn't really get that. We just went through months of repeated bear chase fiascos. Either murdering a pleading man or watching him brutally torn apart. And so this seemed like a cakewalk. Throw on some headphones, crank up the James Brown, lasso a doll, and drag it to a burn pile. Light it up. I was ready. I promised Sasha I'd definitely handle all of these, and we'd find them in the mornings anyway, when we'd both be at home. And September officially rolled into October, and still no scarecrows. I woke up early on October 3rd to get a run in down the country road. I got changed, trying not to wake Sasha, and put on my kicks and grabbed my bear spray, and put Dash's collar on and went out the front door. I made it down the porch steps when my heart leapt into my throat, as I noticed a man standing a ways down the porch towards the kitchen. I gasped and flailed around, bringing my hands up and causing Dash to start barking. I stepped back up onto the porch, strained my neck around to get a better look at my skin, began to crawl. There, in the silvery pre-sunrise wolf light of autumn mornings, was our first scarecrow. Sasha came, running out with a blanket over her shoulders, awoken by Dash's barking, half asleep still, and looking at me concerned. But she knew what was going on before she even stepped outside. She slowed down and put her hand on a doorframe, looking at me with wide eyes. All I had to do was nod. She slowly came out and looked down the porch and we both stared at it in silence. It was a big burlap doll, just as Dan and Lucy had said. It had on denim overalls over a canvas bottom down and with a straw hat. Its hands and feet were, I guess, vaguely hand and foot shaped lumps of burlap. Even though seeing the side of its stitched on face, I could see its shocking detail. It looked like a middle aged man with a calm smile and blue eyes. It was just standing there, upright, and with its arms bent and weird burlap thumbs hooked into its overall straps. Dash had calmed down and was standing at the scarecrow, sniffing its strange burlap foot, like it was just a new piece of furniture. Sasha took a couple of steps towards it. How the hell is it standing like that? It looks like it's got to have a frame to hold it up. That was indeed very strange. It's weird. Lumpy feet were barely touching the ground. I looked for wires or strings that could hold it up. I don't know, I said. 
Dan and Lucy said they'd be in a human-like positions when we find them, and that they collapse like wet piles of straw as soon as we move them. I grabbed the broom and we kept it on the porch since the leaves started falling. I reached it out towards its closest leg and then looked at Sasha for approval. She nodded. I poked its knee inward and sure as hell, it crumpled in on itself like a bag of leaves. It was shocking how fast the human posture and demeanor dissipated from it and it immediately just became exactly as Dan and Luce had described it. A strangely shaped burlap sack filled with wet straw and with its recently semi-normal head now protruding from its piled up form like a strange knob with facial features. Sasha and I looked at each other in amazement as Dash sniffed at its mass. Oh, it was disturbing to look at. We went inside and I gathered up my little collection of scarecrow gear, the lasso, matches and small aluminium can of diesel. Sash, I got this, seriously, you just hang in here with Dash, turn up some music in case it gets a tad noisy and I'll be done in 10 minutes max. I smiled at her reassuringly and she looked concerned and then nodded. All right, we'll be safe, seriously, that thing is disturbing as hell. I went outside, shut the front door behind me, and turned to face the crumpled scarecrow. It really did have a fucked up ambience, I guess, but more than anything else, I was underwhelmed. I looked beyond it to where I'd cleared the burn pile outside the back gate. I decided it'd be best to rope the thing's little lumpy head sticking out from its piled form from the other side of the porch, and then drag it down the steps on the other side. Now, my lasso game wasn't exactly on point. It took me six tries to get the lasso around its head. When I finally did, I slowly pulled the line and watched it tighten around the neck. Damn, I thought. It really was just a burlap sack of wet straw. It made absolutely zero sense how it was physically possible for it to have maintained its standing position. I'll think about that later. I began walking backwards, slowly cinching the lasso loop tight around the doll. It was heavy enough for me to get it pretty tight without starting to move it, but I knew any more tension I needed to start to move, which, I guess, I wasn't quite ready for. My heart was pounding. The way Lucy and Dan described how these things come to life in terrified spurts and bursts have been filling my mind since the autumn came. I did a little lap around the area I was standing, shaking up my hands one by one. I took a deep breath and decided I'd just yank it as hard and as fast as I could until I could drag it down the steps and get it off the porch. I gripped the rope, put it over my shoulder, walked until I could feel the tension and kept my eye on the burn pile. I counted down out loud. Three, two, one, and I surged on. Go! Pulling on it as hard as I could. I had some girth, but wasn't that heavy. Probably 45 pounds, and within two to three seconds, I felt it thumping down the porch steps. I looked back briefly as I dragged it into the yard. So far, so good. I kept charging, digging into the lawn. I ran as fast as I could until I got the way to the gate and stopped. I looked back at the lifeless ragdoll as I opened the gate. I cautiously walked into the meadow where the burn pile was, bringing the lasso rope to tension, and then turned again. I put the rope over my shoulder and charged ahead towards the burn pile. I ran through it and then about six feet beyond until I figured my lumpy straw friend was right where I needed him to be. I looked back and it was. Huh, I thought. I didn't notice any of the spasms or life on the way here I'd been dreading so much or any of the screaming and pleading. Maybe it didn't do it every time. I approached it cautiously and bent down slackened the lasso knot gently and then slowly lifted the rope from around its strangely detailed face and over the straw hut. I grabbed the matches and gas and poured a bit on the leg of the scarecrow, uttered a adios pow and lit a match and dropped it. Dan was right, these things are fucking incendiary and within five seconds the entire thing was engulfed in flames and within thirty it was just dust. <laughs> Welp, I thought to myself. That wasn't half bad. I'll take ten of those over one bear chase any day. I went inside and found Sasha at the kitchen table, who looked up at me with a mix of fear and inquiry, and I smiled at her. It's gone, Sash. It's burned and gone. Nothing to worry about. 
She rattled off five questions in what felt like three seconds. What about the spasms? I didn't hear it screaming or crying. What was that like? What did it say? Was it strong when it came to life while you were moving it? I put my hands up. Well, babe, none of that happened. It just... It's just a scarecrow. A doll. It stayed that way. I dragged it all over to the burn pile, lit it up, and it burned like oiled soaked rags. And that was literally it. Really, it wasn't so bad. And she had a concerned look. None of those things Dan and Lucy said were gonna happen? Happened? No, none of them. It was lifeless the entire time. I can't explain how it was standing when we found it, but that, in addition to it appearing out of thin air, is really the only strange thing about it. She still looked concerned, but it was coupled with relief. I showered and got ready for work, kissed Sasha, and she was on the conference call in the office and turned to leave, but she signaled for me to wait as she muted her phone, took her headset off and turned to face me. Babe, did you... did you feel it when it burned? Did you feel the spirit leave? Like when the light goes out in the pond and we get the fire going, or when the bear starts to drag the naked man away and after he dies? Hmm... I hadn't thought about that. Well, no, I guess I didn't. Sasha looked scared. Harry, shouldn't we feel that? I don't know, Sasha. I mean, I'll say this. When it was on the porch this morning, I sure as hell didn't feel the same as I do when the light is in the pond, or when the naked man is charging towards the house. I didn't feel that dread, panic, or pressure in the air, you know? And Dash wasn't freaking out in the same way he does when that stuff is going on either. He seems fine now too. She nodded. Uh, that's true. I don't know, I just... I really like feeling it leave. Like a lot. Hmm. Me too, babe. I just think this one is different. Dash is at Cave Canary and he seems totally fine. Which he actually did. He was standing looking up at us wagging his tail, happy as a clown. I went to work and when I got home, Sasha seemed much more relaxed. She told Lucy about my report of the experience and Lucy said something along the lines of, well, some of them are more mellow than others, I guess. Life went on. We really enjoyed the October, maybe more than any other stretch of time since we bought the place. It was absolutely stunning with the leaves changing and autumn temperatures are my favourite. I got a nice buck in a national forest above our place during deer season in mid-October. We made steaks, sausage, jerky and burger. And with all the jams and chutneys we canned from our garden bounty. We enjoyed amazing meal after amazing meal and ate like royalty. I was taking a morning dump on the last Saturday in October when I heard Sasha yelling for me to urgently come to the kitchen. Scarecrow number two while I'm going to a number two. <laughs> that would be fitting. I went out into the kitchen and Sasha was standing in her robe, looking out the window. Dash had his paws up on the window sill. I walked up and looked over them. It was a female doll this time, looked like a teenage girl. It was sitting neatly, straight backed, with its hands in its lap, on the little stone wall that ran through our yard, wearing an old-timey dress and a white bonnet. Its face looked kind of sweet, actually, and peaceful. It gave me the chills. Sasha looked up at me. I put my arm around her. I got this, babe. It's a cakewalk. And just keep Dash inside, turn on some music in case this one's a bit louder than the last time, and I'll be back in ten, all right? Sasha looked concerned, but less so than last time. I got my electric assortment of scarecrow gear from next to the front door and went out to assess the extract strategy and best egress route. Again? It was shocking how these damp, flimsy sacks of straw could maintain human posture prior to moving them. Some kind of mounting curse magic, I suppose. My list of unexplainable shit had grown exponentially as of late, so I just added it into the ever-expanding, it is what it is, category. I went and opened a gate ahead of time, this go around, and walked back to the scarecrow. I felt ready. And now the lasso on the second toss, and when it settled around her waist, I began cinching it tight. 
I increased the tension until she toppled over into the grass. All human posture and ladylike dignity extinguished immediately. Just a lumpy bag of straw. I braced myself again, getting ready for the disturbing spasms and jitterings described by Dan and Lucy. I put the rope over my shoulder and began charging across the yard towards the gate and burn pile beyond. Well, this one felt a bit lighter, probably only around five feet tall. And within ten seconds, I was at the gate and I couldn't help but peek back at the doll. Nothing. No signs of life. Just a scarecrow. I bolted the rest of the way until I was face down in the sand on a burn spot. I gently undid the lasso, just as before. Once again, I thought, Huh, really? Not so bad. I put a little gas on the strange antique dress, dropped the match, and poof, roasted down to an ash in 25 seconds. Sasha was relieved it was gone, but seemed concerned by the lack of any frantic animation, which Lucy and Dan described as the most disturbing part of these things. Well, Sash, it is what it is, and they also said they usually only find two or three of these things a year, so that one could be it. We could be done with these things. Sasha then called Lucy and talked about it again. Later that afternoon, I was raking leaves and saw Dan and Lucy's truck headed up the driveway. They parked and Dash trotted out to greet them as they came through the gate. They'd come on over to hear about the second scarecrow encounter. I walked them through it and then re-walked them through the first encounter, and then did both all over again. Dan seemed concerned, which was a bit frustrating to me. I'd really embraced the prospect of being off the hook with this one, especially how disturbing the description of Winter Spirit was, the ghosts, and how heavily that had been weighing on my mind. Harry, it's not like I'm some damn expert on all of this hoopla, alright? But I'm telling you, I've been dragging two or three of those creepy sacks of shit out to a burn pile every year since before you were even born. Alright? I'm telling you, I ain't never experienced anything like what you're saying. They always wake up a few times when you're moving them. They always cry and scream without fail. It's always an unpleasant experience. And that's describing it casually. I just, I, I'm perplexed. And to tell you the truth, I'm a bit perturbed as well. Perplexed and perturbed? Not the two peas, Dan. I responded with a smile, trying to lighten the mood a bit. We'd grown pretty close, Dan and I, and both enjoyed grinding each other's gears. Oh, look, Dan, and Luce, I trust you guys beyond measure. I always will, but that's just what happened, alright? Call up the Shoshan family, if you're worried. Tell them to stop by. I've been jonesing to meet them anyway. Maybe they can shed some light on this lack of scarecrow enthusiasm issue. But I just don't see why it's a problem. Shouldn't it be a good thing, all this bullshit being a bit easier? Dan and Luce looked at each other, and then Dan stared off in contemplation before speaking again. How about this, smartass? He looked back to me with a grin. I'll be meeting old Joe and one of his sons this coming week about some grazing permit work to be doing together. I'll tell him what's going on here and ask his thoughts on it. Maybe ask him to stop by if he can. Latest we've ever found a scarecrow was November 29th, and the earliest we've ever had the winter spirit kickoff was December 13th. So you've got more than a month left for number three to turn up. Should there be a number three? Also, how about this? If you do find a third in the coming weeks, do me a favor and just call me. I'll come over. I'd like to see what's going on here with these lifeless scarecrows, if that's all right. I agreed and Sasha felt better after summoning the elders for a spirit strategy council, as she usually does, and to be honest, as I usually do too, but I was too headstrong at the time to reflect on that gratefulness. And Dan didn't have to wait long for my call. The following Saturday morning, I was starting a pot of coffee in the kitchen before sunrise. I wanted to get out for some grouse hunting. I was getting some mugs out of the dishwasher when I caught something out of place in my periphery. It gave me a start and so I snapped my head over and there was number three. I was a boy this time, looked to be around 13 or 14, dressed up in goofy canvas pants with a rope belt and a white stained button down, and with a bowl cut compromised a bright red yarn. It had a little shit-eating grin 
on his face too. Little fucker. When he was on the back porch, leaning his tailbone onto one of the tall, fancy clay planters Sasha's mum had sent us. Hands at his sides, and with one leg holding him up and the other bent back, pressed against the planter, staring directly into the kitchen window with that creepy little smile. If this little bastard actually wakes up, I thought, I'd make sure to call him a prick before the little spasm of life ended. And as I promised, I called Dan. They woke up around 4.30 every morning, so I knew they'd be up, and Dan answered and said he'd be right over. I went into the bedroom where Sasha had been passed out hard just two minutes earlier, but she was sitting upright in bed, wide-eyed, pale as a ghost. It's here, Harrison, it's here. My blood run cold, but I tried to keep calm. I know, babe, I came in to tell you that. I just found the third scarecrow and it's out on the back porch. She leapt out of bed, straight towards me. No, Harry, it's here. The spirit. I feel it. It's here right now. I put my arms around her. My heart was starting to pound. Babe, it's just the same as before. I already called Dan and he's on his way over. I... Sasha cut me off just as I was noticing the panic in my own voice. It's not the same as before. I know it. You know it. I can feel it, Harry. She was starting to cry. I hugged her. Babe, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, we've done this before. We're doing it now, and we'll do it again. It's okay, Sash. It's okay. And with each passing second, I felt its presence grow. She was right. Sasha insisted on seeing it, despite my suggestion to stay in bed until Dan and I got it burnt. We went into the kitchen, and Dash was at the kitchen door to the porch, and with his head down, growling into the door. That alone gave me an adrenaline shot sufficient to numb my hands. We both stood looking out the window to the scarecrow boy, casually leaning on the back porch, beaming his creepy little smile right into both of us. I turned to Sasha. And see, it's pretty much just the same as before, babe. She bent over and puked right onto the kitchen floor. I grabbed her shoulders and helped steady her and led her to the sink. Dash was starting to bark at the door now. And she wiped her mouth with a towel and stared blankly into the sink for a long time. Holy shit, I need to keep my cool. I pulled her some water and put my arm around her. Sash, it's, it's alright babe, we're prepared for this. We know what to do. It's harmless right now. And she just shook her head, tears welling in her eyes, and looked at me. Harry, that thing is not right. That thing is not just a doll like the rest. I can feel it. There's something evil about this, babe. She barely finished before she started crying hard. I hugged her for a while, walked her to the living room, and sat her down on the couch. I needed to make this all right for her. And when Sasha feels scared, I feel violent. I guess when I get scared, I feel violent too. It's not a very healthy reflex, but it's organic. I rebelled against that growing anger at this doll by trying to act overly casual and trying to get her to smile. I put my hands on her shoulders and smiled at her. I'm going to go out to banish this devil doll back to the depths. Real quick, I'll be back soon. And we'll make some lattes and maybe some mavo toast. Have ourselves a super chill little morning, okay? Stay here and everything's going to be fine. I got a giggle out of her but that one, despite her best efforts. I blocked Dash with my legs as I opened the front door to meet Dan. You're staying inside for a bit, buddy. He gave me his classic. The fuck, bro? We're a team. I looked as I scooted out the front door with a lasso, gas can and coffee, and then shut the door behind me. Morning, Harry. Number three, huh? First item down. Where's it at? I think Dan was trying to do me with what I was trying to do with Sasha, by acting goofy and overly casual. It made me anxious. We walked around to the back porch and I gestured towards the boy with my coffee. Little fella, huh? Well, let's get to it. Let me see how far you come with that lasso, shit kicker. I nodded on the first try. The lasso loop came to rest around its sternum. I cinched the knot until the tension pulled it over, reducing the upper to youthful form into a lumpy, lifeless pile. And Dan nodded. He looked nervous. I felt nervous. I led the rope around until I was in a spot in the yard to pull him straight towards the stairs. My heart was really going. 
I felt like it was guaranteed I'd get introduced to the spasming while moving this bastard. I walked the rope back until there was tension, turned to face the burn pile, and counted down in my head as I surged forward. I felt the boy's burlap straw body thumping down the stairs. Damn, this one was actually the heaviest yet. It must have been at least 65 pounds. I bent down and tightened my grip and pulled with everything in me, ploughing towards the gate, 40 more feet, 30 more. I tried to get into a full sprint, 20 more, 10 more. I had just crossed through the gate, but it felt like the little bastard had gained a hundred more pounds in that distance, and my shoulders and legs were screaming. I dropped the rope and turned to Dan, who was at a dozen paces behind the scarecrow. I pointed down to it, speaking between heavy breaths. <sighs> you ever move one? That far without it moving at all? Without it making a... <sighs> without it making a peep? Dan looked even more nervous than before. He had gone pale and didn't take his eyes off it. No, Harrison. No, I have not. I put my hands on my knees and looked down at the doll, laying on its back, at the little smart-ass smile on its face, its goofy red bowl cut. Dan looked around us. It's here, all right, son. The spirit. Might not have been your first two, but it sure as hellfire is now. I couldn't deny that. I felt it. The tentacles of panic were leeching into my mind. The wind was picking up too, fast. A chill set in that seeped into my bones. Dan looked up at me. Finish this. Finish it now. And I forced my ponder in to the back seat. I scooped up the rope and backpedaled until there was a tension, and then rushed backwards with all of my strength, like I was in a game of tug of war. My feet broke into the frost crusted sand of the burn pile, and the doll was halfway through the gate when it happened. The doll sat bolt up right away from me, tearing the rope out of my hand so fast I fell backwards onto my ass. And I scared me so bad I yelped like a child. It was facing away from me and directly at Dan, who shuffled backwards so fast he fell over as well. The second the boy reached a full sitting position, it screamed. And that scream sounded like a young boy at first, but it grew deeper in pitch, expanding to sound like five different screams at once. A man's, a girl's, a woman's, a horse's and dog's. The air pressure changed and my ears popped. I was immediately nauseous. I realized I couldn't really breathe and started to raise my hands up to cover my ears when all the vitality in the doll extinguished in an instant and it crumpled backwards into a lifeless pile of lumpy wet straw filled burlap staring up at the sky with that creepy ass face. I scrambled to my feet, hurdled the scarecrow and sprinted over to Dan. He was propped up on his elbows staring with blazing focus at the demonic mass. He looked at me. Well... That's a bit more than I'm used to with these bastards. I appreciated his humour. It grounded me. We both caught our breath, and he put his hand on my back. Now you've seen it, son. Now you see why I hate these things like the Dickens. But I say, I never heard that kind of wailing before. It sounded like a chorus of hell. I didn't know what to say, other than to reiterate his earlier directive. Well, let's get this fucking done. And Dan nodded. We picked up the gas can and matches, and we both scooted quickly out of the gate, past the lifeless doll, and given it a wide bath. I snatched up the rope and slowly backed through the sand of my burn pile, leaving footprints through the ash of the two earlier, and much more harmonious sc scarecrows of the season. I went until I had tension on the rope and looked at Dan. I might have appreciated that man more in this moment than I'd ever appreciated the company of any man. He gave me a stern look and nodded. I tore the rope towards me and seethed backwards with all of my strength. I dragged the doll until its waist was almost outside the gate and then it happened again. This time the doll shot its arms over to one side, flipping itself onto its stomach, then lifted up onto all fours and dug its feet, knees and hands into the dirt. I tried to fight against this resistance, but it was like pulling on a rope tied to Dan's truck. Again. The rope tore from my hands and I fell backwards, and Dan slowly paced away. The scarecrow slowly lifted its head up until I could see its eyes boring straight into mine. I shot up to my feet and went for the rope, but the boy yanked it back before I could grasp it, and I watched with dread as it coiled under his arms. And right then, the boy started giggling, and what started as a giggle turned into a devious cackling. The 
that shot ice through my veins and caked my entire body with goosebumps. I grew louder until the boy was in a fit of raucous, deep laughter. The kind of deep, sincere laughter that comes from the belly and the bones. Its eyes were squinted narrow with piercing, glowing blue pupils looking right into me. My skin was crawling, felt like I was covered in insects, and I started dry heaving. And then, as fast as it started, the life ripped out of the devilish child and its body thunked back into the earth like a bag of chains. Dan looked at me with true terror in his eyes, and I was shaking like a leaf. I had a slick of stomach acid along my teeth. I put my hands on my knees and spit into the sand a few times. I caught my breath and managed to form some words. Ever heard one laugh? And Dan didn't respond, or take his eyes from mine. He just slowly shook his head from side to side, and then said, Son, we need to get it outside of this gate right now. My emotions were going nuclear like I'd never felt before. I was experiencing a hundred different things at once. It was like a white hot rolling spectrum of feelings. I felt rage rotate by for a brief moment and I grasped at it like a lifeline. I dove for the doll, seized it by its oily red yarded scalp and with every bit of my will and my body and soul tore it through the gate, screaming my lungs dry until I felt my feet hit the sand of the burn pile. As I dropped it, a storm of dread hit me as a grotesque little burlap hand shot out and grasped my left forearm like a vice, like it was filled with steel. I frantically grabbed at it with my free hand and started yanking at it. And Dan dove out of my periphery to help me as the scarecrow slowly raised its head to look up at me. I didn't even notice when it started, but Dan and I were both screaming, roaring with disgust, horror and sheer effort. And when it met my gaze, it smiled. My bladder released immediately, my nose started bleeding, and my eyeball started vibrating. That sinister stitch work of its mouth twisted and gyrated as it formed words, which came out in English, but in the voice of nothing I'd ever heard. A slow, deep, glottal sucking, fiendish cadence that was terrorizing my mind as much as assault in my ears. You took my land. Neither beast nor man can take land from me, tourist. The rockmen tried. The beast hunters tried. The horsemen tried. The Shoshan tried. The Bannock tried. Fur trappers tried. The priests tried. The homesteaders tried. Your bones, like their bones and all bones, shall be dust long before my essence goes to seed. I am this land. And it released its grasp and collapsed, lifeless, back into the earth. I vomited and could hear Dan coughing. I rolled away from what was now a flaccid sack of straw and pushed myself up onto my knees and forced myself to sit up. I stared up at the sky, trying to catch my breath, coated in my own sand caked vomit and blood. Sasha, I've put us in danger. I've put her in danger. What have I done? What had I fucking done? Dan was already standing, looking at me with a mix of dread and wonder. I called for the box of matches he'd dropped during the struggle and wheezed. Stand back, D. As I struck the fire starter match, and let it burn upside down until it hit the resin and sizzled, then threw it into the burlap heap and felt the cough of heat on my face as it ignited. Dan grabbed me under my arms and held me up, and we trudged back into the yard, where he leaned me up against a cottonwood tree. Dan took a knee in front of me and looked me dead in the eye with a grave sternness. Harrison, what in God's name did you do? And that's when I passed out. I was leaning under that same tree when I came to, surprised to find that I was somehow already drinking a glass of minerally dark green liquid all on my own, and with both Dan and Sasha kneeling in front of me, in deep concern on their faces. And with each sip, I felt life pouring back into me. As soon as I had finished one glass, Sasha put another into my hand. Each gulp brought strength back into my body and clarity back into my mind. I'm alright, I'm alright. I want to stand up on my own. 
They spotted me as I rose like a kid at gymnastics practice, but I was able to get to my feet more easily than I expected and took a few steps. And then I heard Dan speak behind me. Harry, there's someone I'd like you to meet. I spun around, dizzy and surprised, and beheld a striking figure. A tall man, wearing a flannel shirt, under work-worn, carhart overalls. He had long, obsidian black hair tied in a ponytail. He looked about Dan's age and as strong as an ox. Dash, to my surprise, was sitting at his feet, wagging his tail, staring up to him as though he was the king of the universe. Harry, you can call me Joe. He extended a hand the size of a catcher's mitt, and I took it and it was like grabbing an oak limb. It's a pleasure to meet you, Joe. He gestured towards the meadow. Let's take a walk. I looked at Sasha as Joe started to head towards the gate, and she shot me a look back that I hadn't seen from anyone since my mum walked into the mall security office after I got arrested still in Pogs in fifth grade. She nodded towards Joe, and I trailed after him. Joe and I strolled into the meadow and down towards the pond without speaking. He stopped eventually and stared up into the mountains. I stood next to Joe, damping my own piss and vomit, looking up at him in awe of his formidable stature and grace and feeling like dried shit on a forgotten sidewalk. After a long while, Joe turned to me and spoke. Dan and Lucy speak highly of you and your wife. I like Sasha. She is strong and wise. I nodded. Ah, that she is. Dan and Luce speak highly of you and your family as well. They harbour a deep respect for you all, and so do I. I gestured down into the pastures and up towards the mountains. We've, well, this is a special place, and I understand that if it weren't for the wisdom of you and your family, which was shared with us, I don't think me and my wife would have survived past March. Joe just stared at me, into me. After a while, he turned his body towards the mountains and spoke again. Word has it you tried to get a rise out of the spirit, tried to take away its mask. I... I didn't know, I mean... I guess I was just trying to get it to just stay away, you know, leave for good. Without looking back at me, Joe smirked. <laughs> That'll never happen, tough guy. I didn't know what to say. After a while, Joe looked over at me. The last thing you ever want to do is take the earth mask off a dark spirit, Harry. That can put more than just you and your family in danger. You follow the methods we gave Dan and Luce, and you'll stay safe. You promise me that now. And he pointed at the ground and leaned into my face. Right now. And I did. Immediately, without thinking, but no one I meant it to the depth of my soul. I promise, Joe. Joe nodded. Good. He leaned back from my face and turned back to the mountains. I had about 10,000 questions for Joe, but knew I could probably only shake him down for one. Joe, is what I've done... Have I started something irreversible? Is Sasha in danger? Can I come back from this? I guess I went for three. Joe smiled at the mountains with a mix of amusement and annoyance. The spirit does not hold grudges. It teaches lessons. But I think you needed that one, eh? He turned to face me. It takes a lot for a spirit to break its patterns as it did today, Harry. He won't be able to do something like that for a long, long time. And it only would again if you gave it a reason to. No, the patterns will fall back into place and you and Sasha will be fine, so long as you follow our methods. A mixture of relief and shame hit me so hard, I felt like weeping. Joe turned to head back to the house, but stopped. You are a warrior. That can help you and your family lead this kind of life in old country like this, but not in everything. The warrior heart must be tempered. Pride and rage will kill a stupid man like you anywhere, but especially in this valley. Your wife, Sasha, she is wise. She has good instincts. Think and act together, not rashly on your own. And that hound, Dash, huh, that's a strong one. He sees more than you know. That's your family. Trust them. Trust the methods my family shares with yours and you will live with a spirit through the seasons. All I could think to say was, I will. Good, because the seasons are about to turn and I can see in your eyes. He looked back at me. 
you're gonna need some candles. He turned and walked back up towards the house. As I was about to follow after him, I felt something cold gently touch the back of my neck. I turned around, looked over the pasture, and saw that it had started to snow. Wow, 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 and another one, wow. Absolutely chest pounding, riveting stuff. I really enjoyed that one. I wasn't too sure how it was gonna come out and I uh, wasn't too sure how you guys might find it, but uh, personally, I found that one quite chilling. Made goosebumps on the end of my arms stick up. <laughs> As ever, guys and girls, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further, and why not hashtag Team Fear. Big thank you to the author again, Vato Cabron. Amazing work, brother. I uh, anticipate great things from yourself in the future, and hopefully look forward to working with you again. And as ever, guys and girls, I hope you're all keeping happy and healthy, and positive and focused. And above all, remember, be safe, not Sorry.